saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice. We can read. <coughs> Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for being with us this morning, and we come before you, humbling ourselves, that you may educate us and teach us the meekness and lowliness of your Son, Jesus Christ. And even as we want to go through this uh, study, we are praying that you may remind our minds, that we may know how to work fully as well as others. May your blessings be upon us for this, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. We thank God for this opportunity uh, that He has given unto us. I want us to go through uh, this topic. Um, self-support worker. This is a very important uh, lesson for us uh, as ministers of God in these last days. And uh, it has a telling influence uh, if, we, uh, if we take it seriously. It will increase our efficiency in the work, in reaching both our fellow believers, our families, and the world. In Luke chapter 2, verses 49, Luke chapter 2, verses 49 says, And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Well, with you not that I must be about my father's business. So Christ is talking to his disciple, no, no, his mother and his father, that why are you searching for me? Don't you know that I am in my father's business? And today, God is calling us to be in his father's business. We know that as workers, knowing our mission, the purpose of the third angel's message, which we read in 1 MR 228, paragraph 2, that God's purpose in giving the third angel's message is to prepare a people to stand true to him during what time? time. During the time of investigative judgment. And that is why we establish and maintain our, our schools, publishing houses, hygienic restaurants, and treatment rooms, uh, food factories, and we are supposed to carry the work in this what? In this line. So even as we are called to be in the Father's business, we must actually carry out the will of God as it is, uh, as it is written in the Word of God. Every true believer should have a realization of his solemn responsibility before God to be a missionary seeking to save those that are lost. We should see armies of consecrated workers seeking to do not their own will or pleasure, but the will of God. They should be laborers together with God they should walk, pray, and continually what? Look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of their faith. Those who surrender wholly to God will put thought and prayer and honest, consecrated tact into their labor. So we are called as laborers of God, as servants of God, being in the Father's business, to be consecrated to the work. That is so much important. And then we must work, pray, and continually look unto Jesus. Why? Because Christ 
is the author and, the, and finisher of our faith. Um, a successful minister must work according to Christ's patterns. You know that? We are told that that is what the world needs, a revelation of Jesus Christ. And so if we work outside that pattern, Christ method alone, then we cannot reach uh, uh, people effectively. And every minister must learn that method. Now, the call of the disciples, uh, Christ calling the 12 disciples in Matthew chapter 10. Now let's see uh, what Christ told them and when. Yes. The book is Matthew chapter 10 from verse 1. Okay, Matthew chapter 10, verses 1, we are uh, finding the call of the disciples. Okay. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he has called unto whom? Unto Jesus. Now, we as missionaries, the first thing we must be called unto who? unto Jesus because if we are not called unto him then we will be doing the work for another person we must first be called unto Jesus and that is what he did he gave them power so when we are called unto Jesus he gives us what power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases and then from verses 2 up to 4, we, they mention, uh, uh, Matthew mentions the names. This 12, verses 5, Jesus sent forth. Now he calls and then he sends forth. He sent them forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of Samaritans enter ye not but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold, nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Now, that is, there are many lessons to be learned there. Uh, when Christ called his disciples, he gave them the job description, that which they are supposed to do. You know, the mission of Jesus Christ, how it was carried into success in, the, in those four uh, four areas, healing, teaching, preaching, and publishing uh, from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 36. And then he prays, I uh, pray you therefore that the Lord of hosts may send forth laborers. So as a minister, as a worker, we must know our job description. Everyone must know what he's supposed to do and how he's supposed to carry the work. And he says, carry ye not all those things mentioned. Then he said, not yet steps. For the workman is worthy of his meat. During the ministry of Jesus Christ, his disciples actually, he told them to depend wholly on the one who has called them. Because all power is given unto him. And so, even the sustenance in the work was going to be sure. And in the someone on the mountain, I want us to look at something in Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, uh, I'll read from verse, I'll read verses 25. 
being consecrated to the work is the first principle that we must understand even before we ask anything from the Lord. Now, Matthew chapter 6, Christ gives the sermon at the mount. 6 from verses 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Then he says, Behold the force of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? So when Christ is calling, is teaching his disciples, primarily, is telling them that they should not take thought of anything. And then he mentions two things there. In Luke, he mentions the three. Uh, he says, thought of raiment. The next thing, food. And in Luke, he mentioned a roof on your head. Now, he mentions this because he knows that people or ministers are always uh, discouraged in the ministerial work because of those three or two basic needs. And he tells them that is this more than what? Life. What is life? in that phrase. It is life eternal, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is life eternal. And so it tells them to see life is eternal or to work to bring people to know this life eternal and to experience them in their life. And they must have faith. We are called to a work that requires faith. We are called to a work that the propelling uh, factor or what gives us impetus to the work is faith alone through the footsteps of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And then in verses 30, uh, in verses six, uh, chapter 6, verses 33, the Bible says, uh, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All which things? Which are these things? Food and raiment and shelter shall be added unto you. But above more, above all, we should work like Jesus Christ. He said that he did not have anywhere to do what? Yeah. To lay his head. He gave himself for the work. And so that is a principle that we must understand. Casting our cares upon Jesus, having faith in Jesus Christ. As we uh, as we proclaim the, the first, second, and third angel's message, uh, righteousness by faith, doing everything according to the pattern that Christ gave, we can have success than if we will have any worldly policy uh, with us. Now, in Ministry of Healing 480, paragraph 1, so it was with the disciples previously called when previously called, when Jesus bade Peter and his companions follow him, immediately they left their boats and nets. Some of these disciples had friends dependent on them for supper. But when they received the Savior's invitation, they did not hesitate and inquire, how shall I live and sustain my family? They were obedient to the call. And when afterward Jesus asked them, when I sent you without pass and script and shoes, lack ye anything, they could answer nothing. Now, <laughs> they had to take the first step. What was the first step? Akening to the core, isn't it? Yes. And once they gave themselves to the one who was calling them, who was commissioning them, who had all power, it is written that they lack nothing. What do you think? If they lack nothing, what do you think of their families? They lack everything. <laughs> they lack nothing. Yes, okay. Because of the first step. So as ministers, the first step is to take 
my yoke and follow Jesus Christ. And that self, uh, that self-denial, it is written in Ministry of Healing, is it 593? That there's a picture painted of a yoke and what? An ox and the yoke. An ox and the altar. And the inscription is um, uh, to the, maybe you can project it for me, Minister of Healing 593, paragraph 3. So we must be ready to be offered at the altar of sacrifice or to be yoked together uh, with Christ. Is it there? Yes. yes, there is a picture representing a bullock standing between a plow and an altar with the inscription ready for either ready to toil in the furrow or to be offered on the altar of sacrifice. This is the position of the true child of God, willing to go where what? Duty calls to deny self to sacrifice for the Redeemer's cause. So that self-sacrifice, taking the cross, and following Jesus is the first principle that we need to put our mind and attention and effort and earnestness in so that we can succeed in everything. 480 of Minister of Healing, paragraph three. Many who profess to be Christ followers have an anxious, troubled heart because they are afraid to trust themselves with God. They are afraid to do what? Trust themselves with God. They do not make a complete surrender to him, for they shrink from the consequences that such a surrender may involve. Unless they do make this surrender, they cannot find peace. So that is the state of ministers today. Many people are coming to the world, maybe because they are seeing that they will benefit or some trying to escape some responsibilities uh, where uh, they, 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 they look at the ministry as an as a escalator religion in terms of uh, not finding, uh, okay, maybe they'll get immediate uh, gratification that goes by, uh, maybe if someone get to the work, he will get a reward immediately. But that should not be the mind that is calling us to the world. It should be self-sacrifice and giving all to Christ. I like a minister who says that him, he will be wealthy, but he has not chosen to be wealthy. He will if he choose, if you have chosen. But he says that he always come with, he always come to God with an empty wagon. And that empty wagon is filled up to the brim even if it were a trailer the size of this house, filled with money, but he doesn't keep it for himself, he goes and distributes it and comes back again with an empty what? Wagon. That is the situation, that is the nature of the way we should be working. A minister should be in a, a way of surrendering everything to God, giving God his life that he may use him your availability for the work is what will make God's providence in your life to be greater. And um, uh, in Acts of the Apostles 365, paragraph 3, I hope it is so, yes. The energies of the ministers are all needed for his high word calling the highest calling you've been called is to proclaim the first, second, and third angel's message. To proclaim the righteousness of Jesus Christ to the world. That is the highest call that even the, uh, the most educated THD professor has not what? Preached. If you are not working to God, for God we are told in heaven we are idlers, isn't it? Do you know that? If you're not working to God, even if you're working for the highest uh, uh, effective or most influential organization in the world, and you're not working according to God's pattern, you are idle. Yes, his best powers belong to God. 
he should not engage in speculation or in any other business that will turn him aside from his great work. There should be focus. No man that warreth, Paul declares, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Second Timothy 2, for thus the apostle emphasized the minister's need of unreserved consecration to the master's service. The minister who is wholly consecrated to God refuses to engage in business that will hinder him from giving himself fully to his sacred calling. Are you getting that? If God is calling us to the support work, we are going to go deep the model that we need to follow. Christ being the educator and the teacher. Christ being the shepherd that we should follow. We should not engage in any other activity or business that will hinder us from giving himself fully to his sacred calling. In 90, Testimonies Volume 9, for the Church Volume 9, uh, pages 11, says that in a special sense, God has called us Seventh-day Adventists and he has given them the most important message, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message. And nothing is to absorb their what? Their attention. Nothing that is not going to make us achieve this um, final objective should be cast away. So these are the things that we should be looking at, even as we are going to look at self-support mechanisms. Now he says, um, he is not striving for earthly honor or riches. His one purpose is to tell others of the Savior who gave himself to bring to human beings the riches of eternal life. His highest desire is not to lay up treasures in this world, but to bring to the attention of the indifferent and the disloyal the realities of eternity. He may be asked to engage in enterprises which promise large worldly gain, but to such temptations, he returns the answer, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Now, in Luke chapter 12, verses 32, Christ uh, tells his disciples that uh, fear not, ye little word, flow, for it is your father's desire to give you the kingdom, isn't it? Then he said, lay your treasures in the heavenly stores. Put all your energies, all your faculties, all your strength, all your belongings, all that you own in the treasures of, of heaven. It means in the work of God. That is where God is calling us. Consecration to the ministry, uh, even before we ask of anything. Acts of the Apostles 371, paragraph 1. The heart of the true minister is filled with an intense longing to save soul. That is the true heart of a minister. That is the first and the last thing you are thinking of, isn't it? To save souls. Time and strength are spent. Toilsome effort is not shunned. Are you seeing that? <laughs> Toilsome effort is not shunned, for others must hear the truth that brought to his own soul such gladness and peace and joy. The spirit of Christ rests upon him. He watches for souls as one that must give an account. With his eyes fixed on the cross of Calvary, beholding the uplifted Savior, relying on his grace, believing that he will be with him until the end, as his shield, his strength, his efficiency, he works for God. With invitations and pleadings, mingled with assurance of God's love, he seeks to win souls to Jesus, and in heaven he is numbered among those who are called and chosen and faithful. Amen? Amen. Now, where do we get that phrase, called, and chosen and faithful. Now, this message is 
to those who are giving the third angel's message. You know it? And they are in combat, direct combat with the beast. Revelation 17 verses 14. Say that they that are with him are called and chosen and they are qualified and they need to be what? Faithful. And they are consecrated. If you are faithful to the work, it means you are consecrated to the work. So these are the basis, the foundation, the real issue that actually should, uh, should actually propel us in the ministry, uh, in the ministerial work. It is working for God and being faithful and being chosen. You know, when God is calling, uh, when God is calling Timothy, I don't know, is this first Timothy chapter six? Uh, he gives him some good uh, wisdom here that actually should also uh, encourage us. Uh, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, from, uh, from verses 7. 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 6, uh, from verses 7, and you will read it through up to 19. Now, I want just to read a few statements here. It says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we cannot carry, uh, we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therefore with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptations and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all what? Evil. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Are you seeing that? That statement is very serious. But thou, O daughter and son of God, flee these things and follow after what? Righteousness. Godliness faith, love, patience, meekness, then fight the what? Fight the good fight of faith. Lay all on eternal what? Life. Whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give charge, I give the charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ, Jesus, who uh, Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Now, that is a message for workers who want to do the work of God. Follow after, not covetousness. Yes, so in 1 Corinthians 9 7 to 14, Paul says that, do you not know that they would minister about holy things, live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so, as the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Who are ministering at the altar? The priests. And the Levites also were given a privilege, opportunity to take charge of the sanctuary activities. And so you know that that system of the Jewish economy, they had an economy of supporting those who are working. And uh, because these people were first, they were wholly separated and consecrated for the work of the sanctuary. And so that is why they had to be supported. Now us, how are we supposed to work? Of course, those who have given themselves wholly to the work should be supported. But they should look a little high. We should find a very proficient and effective way of reaching out to the people without burdening. Because you know, in ministry of, no, 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 in early writing, think page, is it 266? The topic covetousness. He said that I saw the devil 
Satan and his angels gather together and they are saying that we are going to the meetings of Sabbath keepers. And we are saying, how can we make them and their ministers to be discouraged in the work? And uh, some suggested this, another suggested that. And then finally they say that we want to make their ministers to, um, to be discouraged by cutting off the support and making the church members to be more what? Covetous. Are you seeing that? Uh, uh, be with them that they may not, they, they can withhold means to support the work so that their ministers can be drag, driven into one. And then we will even cause confusion in their meeting. Then we will have all the rank of Sabbath keepers in our meet, uh, in our control. So we know there's self-aggrandizement, self-abnegation. People are driving everything. To them. People don't want to, to give for the cause of God. Liberality is not there. And now, how should we work in a way that people are not going to see that we are burdening them? Are you seeing that? So that is where self-support work is going to come in. Acts of the Apostles. 337 paragraph 2. These are very serious and important um, points. It is not God's purpose that Christians whose privileges far exceed those of the Jewish nation shall give less free than they give. Privileges far exceeding those of Jewish nation. Are we privileged more than them? <laughs> yes. Um, we should actually told give not uh, less freely. I don't know. We should give regularly. And to whatsoever much is given, the Savior declared of him shall be much what? Required. The liberality required of the Hebrews was largely to benefit their own nation. Today, the work of God extends over all the earth. The three angels' messages in the hands of his followers, Christ has placed the treasures of the gospel. And upon them, he has laid the responsibility of giving the glad tidings of salvation to the world. Surely our obligations are much greater than what those of ancient Israel. Now, Ours is to finish the work, to finish the work in all the work, but finishing the work using Christ's method alone. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, the Israelites were supposed to demonstrate that character. We are told if they would have followed the plan that God has given them, uh, Christ would have come. If they would have accepted the Messiah, Jesus Christ, uh, Maybe we will, have, no, we, will not, we will have not been born, sorry. We will have been he in heaven. But now, here we are. Here we are. We have to work in an effective way. Because this work requires us to be spent and to spend for the gospel. Do you know that Samaritan uh, uh, who found a Levite who was beaten with the robbers. Are you seeing that? Yes, that was a Levite who was beaten there. <laughs> who was, uh, there's something there. It's not medical missionary class time. But let me show you something in Luke chapter 10. Is it Luke chapter 10? Yes. Uh, Luke chapter 10. Okay, Luke chapter 10, verses 29. Verses 29. But he, willing to justify himself, this was, this was a lawyer, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering, said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho 
and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And then, by chance, there came a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed on the other side. That was a fellow Levite, a fellow worker. <laughs> and you know that is, I am connecting this with the, with the self-supporting one. Because as we're going to study by, we're seeing that we are called to support our fellow, uh, our fellow laborers. Are you seeing that? Yes. Those, um, a certain minister may have a means. He should be able to help another minister who is in one. So you find this, a priest, a pastor, and then maybe uh, another uh, another elder or deacon passes by and he leaves a fellow minister who is in one and goes his way and looks as if he has not what? <laughs> he has not seen. And this person has no raiment. This person is naked. Are you seeing that? I think you should be starting to think. You should be thinking now. Uh, and he's wounded, perhaps sick. A fellow minister is sick. He needs to be supported. And then what this man did, we are told, uh, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his hooves, pouring in oil and wine and set on his own beast. Are you seeing that? Oh, this one was having a beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pens and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now these three thinkest now thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves. Now, as ministers, we need to see ourselves in that verse. Have you seen that? And we need means. Some of the requirements will need means in order to support our fellow brethren. And you know, this person gave himself even to be with that Levite overnight. That person was in the ward, in the inn or the sanitary. He went and watched over him overnight, and then the following day, he gave what he had, isn't it? Was he going to be paid back? No, no one was going to pay him back. He was not going to the treasury, the synagogue, say, one of the Levites was wounded. Now give me some what? <laughs> some offering, some benevolent funds to go and do what? Help him. Now we should consider each other as neighbors. Who is your neighbor? You're going to understand really who your neighbor is. If actually you're working Christ method and the spirit of Christ in you, you're going to see that. As God's work extends, call for help will come more and more frequent that this cause may be answered. Christians should hear the command, bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. Malachi 3.10. If professing Christian will faithfully bring to God their tithes and offerings, his treasury will be full. There will then be no occasion to resort to fairs, lotteries, or parties of pleasures to secure funds for the support of the gospel. Why have we, in the mission field, uh, for those who uh, managed to conduct mission field, maybe in your churches or your colleges, we used to have cards and what? <laughs> Cards, you go and start begging, begging for fun. It is what? Yes. And some, you will find that because of this, some harambis are even held by those who are hidden, isn't it? 
in a way that does not prescribe. That just in a way to get what? To get, to get fun. We have to have a way that is effective, a way that is pleasing to God, a way that is going to glorify God in uh, supporting our ministers and ourselves. Remember, it is self-support work. That is the topic. So you think about yourself. At the end of this lesson, you should have known about how you are going to go about it. The spirit of liberality is the spirit of heaven. This spirit finds its highest manifestation in Christ's sacrifice on the cross. In our behalf, the Father gave his only begotten Son, and Christ, having given up all that he had, then gave himself, that man might be saved. The cross of Calvary should appeal to the benevolence of every follower of the Savior. The principle there illustrated is to give, give. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. So that is the, the spirit that God is calling us. The liberality, the first spirit of liberality is giving ourselves. Isn't it? Yes, giving ourselves to be offered and to yoke together with Jesus Christ. And then that which we have been freely given, temporarily, uh, a bit materialistically or spiritually, that we are supposed to give. And then God uh, blesses the world. Now, we, uh, we learn the church organization in the New Testament uh, uh, era. And we see how from the call of the disciples and how they were moving with the world, giving themselves only to God, surrendering everything that they had to God. And then we find the call of God, uh, the, call of, the call of Paul. We find many lessons that are related to the self-support work. And this should be looked actually uh, deeply as we look at uh, the bestowal of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples. They were given gifts, isn't it? They were given what? Gifts of the Holy Spirit. And if we receive, that reminds me, if we receive the power of the Holy Spirit, we also receive the gifts and the talents that accompanies them. And when we re revive those gifts where we are talented in, God multiply what we have, the word of God, enriching the others. Are you seeing that? Yesterday we were reading Acts chapter 6 that the deacons were chosen. And when they began ministering, how was the work? It was great. And thousands were added into the work, into the church. Now, those are the principles that we need to look into. But today, I just want us to look at self support, Paul's method. How did Paul manage to plant all those churches? By the way, without Paul, would we have heard the New Testament? <laughs> yes, perhaps we'll have heard. But who contributed largely? Paul. All those churches, Paul is the one. And now we want, because Paul tells us that we follow him as he followed what? Jesus Christ which means we follow the pattern of Jesus Christ in, at his very, very basis. Now, Paul was a minister, and we are told in Acts of the Apostles 346, paragraph one, that while Paul was careful to set before his converts the plain teachings of scripture regarding the proper support of the work of God, and while he claimed for himself as a minister of the gospel, the power to forbear working, as secular employment as a means of self-support. Yet at various times during his ministry, in the great centers of civilization, he wrote at a handicap, handicraft for his own work, maintenance. Have you seen how Paul was working? He's saying there are places that he went to that he wanted to show an example. 
he wanted to actually give uh, a gospel that is not going to die off or a gospel that is not going to be seen as fanaticism. <laughs> uh, maybe if God impresses in my mind, I'll give you a story uh, that relates to this. He says, among the Jews, physical toil was not thought strange or degrading. Through Moses, the Hebrews had been instructed to train their children to industrious habits, and it was regarded as a sin to allow the youth to grow up in ignorance of physical labor. Even though a child was to be educated for holy office, a knowledge of practical life was thought essential. So for us to be effective missionaries or workers for God, we must take into thought and knowledge the practical duties of life. That is why the manner we are going to work is totally different with how the evangelicals or other people work. It should be, uh, it should be eyed towards actually bringing the practical godliness to the work. We are told reformation is not having power because the gospel is presented in a, with a lifeless word, power, Minister of Healing 143. Gospel is practiced with a lifeless power. There's no practicality in the gospel. And so for us to bring that practicality in the gospel, bringing people to the basic understanding of the, of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the best way is to learn industrial habits. People have learned, have known that being a minister is just a, a, a free, um, it is a, a very comfortable re, uh, occupation. And that's why many people today, if they try another thing and it fails, and then someone tries to play good in the church, and then he comes to the elders and tells them, I feel God is calling me to be a pastor, and then uh, Arambes are called, and someone is taken to the world. But that person was not called to be a pastor or a minister of God, because they know that after you have graduated, it will be now an easy word. <laughs> that is how people view ministry. It is a, way, a place where you just you just find favors and many other things. You, 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 you live a very easy life. That will not bring impetus to the gospel and it will not give an example of Jesus to the people. If we follow Jesus Christ, the gospel is the life of who? Jesus Christ. And we should follow him, not after at the cross, seeing him uh, dying, and that blood flowing and we feel very emotional and feel like crying and then you say that is the jesus we see there that is the jesus we love no the jesus we love should be the one from birth isn't it the one we are seeing laboring at his father's carpenter's shop toiling with his hands to meet the needs of others don't you think that jesus met the need of others yes and that is where God is calling us. For us to self-support ourselves, we must train ourselves in industrial habits. We must learn to use our hands, our minds, our bestowed, God-given bestowed talents to work for the Lord, to support our, 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 our ministries and to support ourselves and our families you know it is written that if you go to america god forbid <laughs> you go to america now that is a very dangerous zone this time back. and you are preaching there you're saying that me i'm a preacher and back at home you have maybe siblings or maybe a wife or maybe friend 
and you cannot support them, but you are preaching the third angel's message. What are you doing? Are you preaching the real truth or you are an hypocrite? Yes, the Bible says that anyone who cannot support is what? Yes, is worse than infidel. If you can not support the very one, your family or the households of faith, then you are worse than an infidel. Who is an infidel? <laughs> Yes. Yes. So you are worse than an infidel. There's a quote that said half reformed is worse than a what? An infidel. So you are someone who is doing reformation. You are calling yourself a what? A reformer. But these basic truths and life um, uh, lifestyles and uh, living uh, conditions are not followed, then your gospel is just like a canker worm. Your gospel will not have an impression in the hearts of people. I think that is the gospel that people preach when someone dies, when your father dies, that is when you buy him a what? A suit. <laughs> With a very expensive coffee. That is when you, you, you build him a house, isn't it? That is, isn't that what people do? Yes. That is the time that is ferry in a vehicle from the mortuary, by the way, coming home. So that is how people live today. The men of God should be able to support their families. And we have to, we can only reach that standard if we teach ourselves, before teaching our children, if you have a child, these principles, self-dependent. They need to live on their own. And, um, that's why true education is needed. Before he became a disciple of Jesus Christ, Paul had occupied a high position and was not dependent upon manual labor for support. But afterward, when he had used all his means in furthering the cause of Christ, <laughs> that is very interesting, he resorted at times to his what? Trade. To gain a what? A livelihood. Especially was this the case when he labored in places where his motives might have been misunderstood. Now I want us to underline those uh, those statements. When he was not going for some ministerial duties, he resorted to doing what? He was doing the tent making, the art of tent making. He was having a trade, isn't it? He was having a skill and knowledge that he was uh, enhancing in his life, that he was using to reach out to people. And what was the reason why he was doing this? Yes. So there were some prejudices that was being shown. And the way people were viewing him or ministry, he was trying to close that door where people may think that this man has just come for our what? For our tithes and offerings or our money. This man has just come for our favors. So uh, for him to block that, he had to go for his, uh, for, for his trip. You know, we are told that for us to be effective in our uh, mission, we have to, uh, we have to, uh, we have to be having some knowledge. The quote is in education, 
education page 218. Yes, uh, education page 218. I just want to read uh, some part here. Let me share it with us. Okay. Uh, we, we are told that in order to reach out to the people, we must actually have some talent or some trick. Yes, uh, this education page. 218 paragraph 2 it says the work should have a definite aim and should be thorough while every person needs some knowledge of different handicrafts it is indispensable that dispensable that he become proficient in at least one so it means we have many traits, but you should be proficient in at least what? One trait that can enable you to do the work of God. Which are some of the traits, you know? Can we interrupt? Felix? Carpentry. Carpentry. Thank you. Masonry, Elder. Shoemaking, shoe yes. Business. business, with business specifically. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sami? Computer. <laughs> yes, computer. Mugo? Yes, agriculture. Early? Mechanics. Early? Amen. Or book binding. Now, those are some of the traits. Cookery, or cook, cooking, um, tailoring. Uh, there are very many that we need to learn. But you need to be, pro if, uh, you need to be proficient in at least wow. one. So ask yourself, which one are you proficient in? Who is proficient in tent making? No. Now we need to, to know uh, our talents that we may work them in the course of God, in the, in the gospel work, that we may uh, actually reach out to the people. So we are told Paul was dependent with the works, uh, on the works of his hands. Acts of the Apostles, I have not stopped sharing. It is at Thessaloniki that we first read of Paul's working with his hands in supporting labor while preaching the word. Writing to the church of believers there, he reminded them that he might have been burdensome to them and added, Ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we will not be changeable unto, uh, chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. And again, in this second epistle to them, he declared that he and his fellow laborer, while with them, had not eaten any man's bread for no. <laughs> Night and day we walked, he wrote, that we might not be cha uh, chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Are you seeing that? <laughs> so 
it is sometimes good that even if you are a minister, you come to a place and you find good cooked food, you can offer to do what? <laughs> to pay. <laughs> Amen. Okay, um, <laughs> you know, we are learning from Paul's example. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> let me interrupt you. Yeah, you found that we are having two books by this guy and, and then we borrow transport to go to Liberia. It's a shame. Now think about that before the lesson ends. <laughs> okay, so Paul actually supported those people in the food that they ate in every service that they saw wise uh, they saw it wise to uh to to pay so that they may live an ensemble and to uh and to them that they may fall do you know what was happening at the salonic they were busy bodies yes I just want to be a minister, just carrying a big Bible, and you are going, <laughs> you are going door to door, or where are you going to? You are going to, uh, you are going to crusade after crusade, but you want people to do what? To, to, to give you favors as you end the what? The meeting. But there's nothing you can give, even for a, someone who was there who was having a need. Are you seeing that? So, because you know i realized that young men or people really esteem preachers very much when they see you standing here they want to copy everything you are doing what you are saying having you know even how you dress how you shave how you walk all those things the bible you carry <laughs> yeah so they want to be like that so if you are someone who is just less they just normally see you uh walking around with that big bible and, and speaking uh that's big english they just want to be like that they don't want to walk they don't yes now you find that if you if if you are someone who is uh holistic in his ministry if they come to you to your place what you are discussing with them you impress in their mind that they need to support themselves that this work it is not you are not coming to this work you want to be a minister yes not that you come and get money but you come that you may work with your hands so that you can support the cause of who of god that one you are living a good example and you are making the gospel of God of none effect, but you are making it more effective, isn't it? Yes. yes, that is the manner that Paul worked, that uh, that was the ensemble he left unto them. Now, you go to a place and you are a minister, maybe for a week or two or a month. What do you leave for those people? something that can make someone to to stand for himself which knowledge practical knowledge are you seeing that do, 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 do we normally give that it is rare you just go you stand there in the pulpit and you do what at the end of your time there you just go which skill do you leave for the young people or even for the ministers in that place paul left they could see Paul working with his hands. And so when he was retiring after ministering, he's not going to story and watch football, no. They find him working with this what? His hand, making a tent. It is that, it, it is at Thessalonica, Nica, that we first read of Paul's working with his hands in self-supporting labor while preaching the word writing to the church of believers there he reminded them that he might have been burdensome to them and um i think i i've repeated it sorry okay let me go to the next slide
helium uh, Okay, let me now share it. It went. <clears throat> Are we seeing it? Yeah. Um, it says at Thessalonica, Paul had met those who refused to work with their hands. It was of this class that he afterward wrote, there are some which walk among you disorderly. <laughs> they are hovering over the what? Churches. That is, a, that is something, a, a very applicable and right work to use, right? Hovering over the churches. Working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now, them that are such, we command, we do what? We command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, all power is given to Jesus Christ. And now if someone is commanding and ordering you with this power, you need to wake up. You need not to sleep. That which quietness, they, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. While laboring in Thessalonica, Paul had been careful to set before such ones a right example. Even when we were with you, he wrote, this we commanded you that if any will not work, neither should he do what? Eat. Yeah, so even if you are a minister, sometimes you need to give a minister a agenda during the time when he's not doing what? Laboring. Oh, the minister need to see that, where he needed to, to help. I was reading somewhere where uh, the inspiration says that a minister should actually involve uh, himself in some of the duties that are being done in the place where he has gone to minister. Yes, so he should not be just seen here and then go and sit and the house of visitors and just there or if you have a laptop you're just there watching someone or just doing what browsing no you need if in the morning people need them to go and fetch water you need to do what are you seeing that you need to do that. that one you will be actually you will be mingling with people and sharing finding opportunity to share your ideas. Someone may come and ask you, hey, young man, how are you surviving in this ministry? Which you will have not found opportunity to ask me when you are just in the pulpit, isn't it? How can I go about this? So we, are, we need to learn labor, manual labor. It makes us to give good example. Because the reason why I'm saying that uh, young ministers, who feel that they are called are very excited. And now anything that comes with practical duties of life, they don't want to associate themselves. Yes, I, I, when we were called to ministry and God was calling each and every one of us with some friend, I think Nango was there, Zadok was there. We, we wanted to do farming, but we were really trying, trying every day, but failing terribly. But we, we were understanding that actually the only effective way that we can support ourselves and do the work of God is doing the farming work. <laughs> and now there's a time that they came to my place. They saw the farm, they were very, I was uh, planting some watermelon. And so we took that, we are going also to begin a program, a project for that watermelon. We were counting if we plant 1,000 watermelons, 
and eat watermelon, let's say, let's pray, because we are working for God, is going to give us those big, medium-sized ones. And then we are going to sell each at 150 at the lowest cost. So count that with, with 1,000. That one is about 1.5 million, right? There we are going to get a land, and we are going to begin our bail as a notorial. How oh, then people went. Everyone was very happy because of what they saw. Now, when it came to the time of executing the, the project, people went and bought seeds. People went and got a land, hired a land. At the end of three months, only 33,000 with the debts. Discouraged. Some people say this is not pain. Farming is not doing what? Pain. <laughs> we need to think of another word. Another word. Now, let me tell you, even with the trades that we have, sometimes we will face difficulties. Sometimes we will not actually uh, meet our targets. But if it is the trade that you are proficient in, God is calling you to go forward and pray that he may give you knowledge and wisdom and learn from the difficulties. So that uh, even Paul had difficulties, isn't it? In his work. Yes, so even if God is calling us to be proficient workers, having at least one trade, the difficulties are going to be met, but we have hope that God is, uh, is able to take us through. He has a thousand ways of providing for us. This is what you are saying. You okay. need not to the week of prayer. It does not detract from the dignity of a gospel minister to bring in food and water when needed or to exercise by doing necessary work in the family where he is entertained. Wow. Yes. Tell me of how many do that one. <laughs> <laughs> And that one is very interesting. There's a place she says that, um, hey, there's a place she says when ministers go to a place, they are, they are clothes should not be washed by the people of that homestead. They should wash their own clothes. There is a mistake people do. That now you just give people clothes to wash for them. It's not really inspiration, it's, it's unbecoming. Yeah, it is not good. And we need actually, uh, we need actually to come to a point where we learn things. Okay. In Acts of the Apostles 348, paragraph one, in every age, Satan has sought to impair the efforts of God's servants by introducing into the church a spirit of fanaticism. Thus, it was in Paul's day, and thus it was in later centuries during the time of the Reformation. And I say thus, it is even with us today, isn't it? Wycliffe, Luther, and many others who blessed the world, the, the world by their influence and their faith, encountered the wiles by which the enemy seeks to lead into fanaticism of a zealous, unbalanced, and unsanctified mind. Misguided souls have taught that the attainment of true holiness carries the mind above all earthly thoughts and leads men to refrain wholly from labor. Others taking extreme views of certain texts of scriptures have taught that it is a sin to work that Christians should take no thought concerning the temporal welfare of themselves or their families, but should devote their lives only to spiritual work. Things, the teaching and example of the Apostle Paul are a rebuke to such extreme. Now they may quote uh, what I quoted for you. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 uh, to 28, to 29, or up to 33. But there, Christ uses an example of look at the falls of the egg. They do what? 
They labor not, but they eat, right? But let me tell you, can a bird get a food if he has not gone out of the nest? So that is a principle that people don't see there. The bird has to do what? Go out. And now you may say, oh, I've gone out, I'm now in the field working, isn't it? But you will not achieve, you will not achieve, uh, you will not achieve gloriously or efficiently, effectively, if you have not imparted some skill. If they, these people have seen you, uh, have seen that uh, you are not actually having some practical uh, you are not living some life, practical life skills in your life. You know, like we go to a house, you are given a bed in the house, in the bedding, and then you don't even see that that house is dirty, you need to do what? You want, see, people are, are taught just to be, if you are a visitor, you just did. Even the bed, some do not do what? Even your shoes, you are waiting for someone to do what? <laughs> we need to be very careful, brothers and sisters. Those skills are very important. Let them wake up, find when the house is clean and warm and arranged. They will see that this is a minister of a different world. And the youths will be following your example. That is the example that we need to teach the people. Paul was not wholly dependent upon the labor of his hand for support while at Thessalonica, referring later to his experiences in that city, he wrote to the Philippians, believers in acknowledgement of the gifts he had received from them while they are saying, even in Thessalonica, he sent once and again unto my necessity. Notwithstanding the fact that he received this help, he was careful to set before the Thessalonians an example of diligence so that none could rightfully accuse him of covetousness. And also that those who, had, who held fanatical views regarding manual labor might, might, uh, might be given a practical review. You don't give a theoretical review, a practical review. And also that people may not see you just to be covetous. You just want things. They should see you as someone who is doing something. You should even support the work going on there. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah that one will make us to be effective self-support ministers. It continues to say, when Paul first visited Corinth, he found himself among a people who were suspicious of the motives of strangers. The Greeks on the sea coast were keen traders. So long as uh, so long had they trained themselves in sharp business practices that they had come to believe that gain was godliness and that to make money, whether by fair means or Paul, was commendable. Paul was acquainted with their characteristics and he will give them no occasion for saying that he preached the gospel in order to enrich himself. He might justly have claimed support from his Corinthians hearers, but his, this right he was willing to forego. So he had a right to claim those things, but he was willing to do what? To forego, lest his usefulness and success as a minister should be injured by the unjust suspicion that he was preaching the gospel for gain. He will seek to remove all occasion for misrepresentation that the force of his message might not be lost. Sometimes the force of our message is lost. Because this person just came to preach for us, maybe tithes and offerings. He just came to preach for us how we need to support uh, him and his family and the work of, that he's doing. But you have not shown an example of how you yourself have been working to support that work. That so we need to labor uh, 
following the, uh, the principle that Paul followed. And as ministers who are having families, I say that those ministers actually, the requirements and the responsibilities are very great. You know that? Those family members need food. The children need, need food. You just know when you come here and people are hungry and it is approaching lunchtime, you go, people are hovering around the world, kitchen, they need food. So just the same way if you're a minister, your family needs what? Food. The best trade, and I'm seeing this is the basic trade that every person must know and practice is gardening. Even if you have a small farm, you should show God, before you ask God to give you a country, you should show God that you can utilize that small farm that you have to produce what? Food. Because at the end of the day, people will need food. But you can cut a lot of cost by just producing food, growing them yourself. And that is very important for you, even if you don't have money, but at least when they go to the farm, they can get what? Food. So the basic trade that everyone needs to practice is farming. Let me read for us a statement here. Is it in FE? Uh, the quote says, that agriculture can be used for self-support. Let me see if I can get it. Um, It says that agriculture can be. Uh, yes, let me read this in PH one twenty four. In child guidance, also it is there. <coughs> <laughs> okay. I also get one here. A student should be given a practical education in agriculture. This will be of inestimable value to many in their future work. What is the future work of the children, by the way? Every daughter and son of God should be a what? A missionary. The training to be obtained in felling trees and in tilling the soil, as well as in literary lines, is the education that our youth should seek to obtain. Agriculture will open resources for self-support. Other lines of work adapted to different students may also be carried on, but the cultivation of the land will bring a special blessing to the workers. We should so train the youth that they will love to engage in the cultivation of the soil. So agriculture still forms the basis of uh, true reformation in practical lines because we are told that in the beginning God planted a, 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 a garden in the east of Eden and there he placed who? He placed man so that he can get his food from them. So if we actually approach agriculture with, uh, with an open and a dedicated mind, we will be getting our support. For those who have learned, uh, you can do something that can help you to sustain the world. And also, you make sure that it is not something that 
holds you up. You know, Paul was not held up by the trade that he had, isn't it? That is the danger now. Uh, you must actually counter those balances. Uh, you should not be held by held by the uh, by the <laughs> by the work that you you are doing by the trade that secular work. You need to have something that will not hurt. If you plant, <laughs> okay, maybe you can plant watermelons, but hire someone. But if it is you alone, you will be missing many missions. You know that? How many have planted watermelon seed? You have to be watching for it like someone in ICU every day. Tomatoes, like someone in ICU. You need, if you are having some business enterprises, it should be that which gives you time to do what? To go and minister to God's work. I want to finish up by a few statements here. In Acts of the Apostle 352, paragraph 1. This Paul sometimes work night and day, not only for his own support but that he might assist his fellow laborers. And then I added that statement there. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, but especially who are of the household of faith, that Catholic outside there yeah. is your fellow laborers. Let us do to them good first. Our own family. He shared his enemy earnings with Luke and helped Timothy. He even suffered hunger at times that he might relieve the necessities of others. What a wonderful heart. Is when he could forgo his breakfast and lunch and help others. His was an unselfish life. Toward the close of his ministry, on the occasion of his farewell, talk to the elders of Ephesus at Miletus, he could lift up before them his toil-worn hands and say, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yeah, ye yourself know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities, and to them that were with me, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord, Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, if you read the third angel's message, the practical God means. Isaiah 58. You know, that is the righteousness by faith in verity, in its practical sense, isn't it? If you read that first, those chapters, we see where self support work fits. Because it says that we must support the weak. There are those who are lacking when we go for missions. There are those who need our help. How will we support them if we ourselves cannot support ourselves, even putting food in our table? Are you seeing that, Charlie? When, when, uh, when the Sangalu goes and there's no money and selling, there's no ties and offer when it's coming again. But the work has still to go on. The people have to go from cities and places somewhere that they can survive until the great time of travel. But if we don't have places and these uh, trades and all this stuff that are self sustaining, it will become so hard. If you are struggling now, let's have a local start. Yes, so it, it means that we will not be able to offer something better to the world. We will be queuing with the world. And then when you're about to get your food, you tell someone, you know, Sunday sacredness. That person looks at you and says, you are not serious. 
So we need actually to think in this practical line, in anything that can help us to sustain ourselves. And the, the, the one, this brings us to food. Food is number one thing. So if you will not have food to give to someone, then it will be a what? A challenge. We are told in PK 184 that the devil say that for want of food and raiment, I will have the whole world under my dominion. For want of food and what? Raiment. Human laws are going to be so stringent and no one will dare keep the seventh day Sabbath. Are we ready for that? We can only offer what we have. We can only help and help that is more effective and peaceful and sustaining and, and, and actually bringing joy is of that which you yourself has participated in. Donations will be cut off. You know that? <laughs> yeah, you know, people depend on aids and donations. They will be cut off. Will your ministry end? Let me say if maybe some of us here receiving tithes and offering, and it is cut off, will you die angry? You know, we should be thinking on that. Will you compromise because of that? We need to think. And any talent that you have that you feel God has, is calling you to, uh, to use, uh, you need to, to utilize it. And as a, uh, as, even as workers, even as workers, you know, the reason why sometimes we, we are in one is because we've not followed some principles and people want to work themselves and when people don't want to uh, engage others on maybe ideas. We were supposed to have sanitariums working, isn't it? And those sanitariums, some are to be supported by maybe food and maybe, uh, maybe we have some help that are needed. You know, if the way we are here, maybe someone is having some producing some herbs, which I don't have, and I'm in a sanitarium. I can support that guy, that person, by taking buying of what he does, if he has, isn't it? If he has grapes, he has lentils. I don't have lentils, but I need it in the what? In the sanitarium. I buy from him. Have I, even, even I supported him or have I? Yes, I've supported him. So if everyone will know his talent and do it properly and have the economy that God wants us to have, I tell you, we cannot be driven to one. We cannot stop. The work of God can go forward in a mighty way. The work of God can achieve, the third angel's message can achieve his work. We have vegetarian restaurant ministry that many of us do not know how it operates and how it needs to carry out its work. Those are agencies that can help our workers to support themselves by actually donating their skills to, uh, to those agencies. But few understand about that. So there are many ways that actually self-support work can be uh, can be executed in our in our in our lives or in our ministry, and everyone need to sit down and know where actually God can uh, can use Him best so that He can uh, support the work of God. I want to end with this statement here. There are times when it seems to be uh, to the servant of God, impossible to do the work necessary to be done. Because of the lack of means to carry on a strong, solid work, some are fearful that with the facilities that they are at their command, they cannot do all that they feel it 
their duty to do. But if they advance in faith, the salvation of God will be revealed and prosperity will attend their efforts. He who has bidden his followers go into all parts of the world will sustain every laborer who in obedience to his command seeks to proclaim his message. So seek to proclaim that message first and then do what you can with the talent that God has given you. Think, consult, counsel with another and our ministry is not going to be a dependent ministry. It's going to be a self-supporting ministry. And we can now bring our, uh, in, in, in Acts to say that they brought their treasures at the feet of what? Apostles. And with that way, in that way, in that sense, the gospel will have life. You know, the gospel is dead today because we are not working Christ's method. Christ's method alone will bring true success. Are we ready for that? Yes, you need to be ready. After this, and even now, may God help us. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for educating us and breathing your spirit in our minds through this encouraging and words that bring us to God and to do everything according to the plan. Lord, we are praying that you may give us wisdom and intelligence in working to the world for the world that they may know that you are the only true God and your son, Jesus Christ, by the practical godliness and living gospel that imparts the character of your son in their hearts. So be with us and bless us together, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.